Good morning. My name is Leslie Hayton. Today, we conclude our four-week sermon series, Called In, and turn to Colossians 2, 6 through 15. As you therefore have received Christ Jesus the Lord, continue to walk in him, rooted and built up in him and established in the faith, just as you were taught, abounding in thanksgiving. Watch out that no one takes you captive through philosophy and empty deceit, according to human tradition, according to the elemental principles of the world, and not according to Christ. For in him the whole fullness of deity dwells bodily, and you have come to fullness in him, who is the head of every ruler and authority. In him also you were circumcised with a spiritual circumcision, by the removal of the body of the flesh in the circumcision of Christ. When you were buried with him in baptism, you were also raised with him through the faith and the power of God, who raised him from the dead. And when you were dead in trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made you alive together with him. When he forgave us all our trespasses, erasing the record that stood against us with his legal demands, he set this aside, nailing it to the cross. He disarmed the rulers and authorities and made a public example of them, trium triumphing over them in it. Holy words for God's people. Thanks be to God. so excited at the front end of the service that I told the story about the birthday party then that I was supposed to tell now. So, so yesterday I was at a birthday party and I just want to reiterate that you are welcome, that you belong, and we're grateful to have you in service. You're welcome here, especially if you've been pushed out and kept out of places in community and in places of faith. And we'll talk more about what that means in just a few minutes. Let's pray together. Oh God, be present here and in all the places from which we are worshiping, move in us and through us, that we too would be moved and changed. Speak to us, we pray, less of me, more of you, none of me, all of you. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be pleasing in your sight, our rock and our redeemer, amen. Amen. I, I saw a brilliant post on Facebook this week. Uh, it was posted by a friend of mine without an original source, and so I can't give credit to the creator of this post, but it truly was uh, brilliant. It had the header, uh, Growing Up in Theater, and under that it had a picture of a child, uh, both hands clenched in fists, eyes super wide open, teeth clenched in a tight smile, waiting in excited anticipation. And under that, it had the words, this is me waiting for my child to ask me how many minutes there are in a year. <laughs> for those of you who are well-versed in theater, perhaps you're already singing in your head those famous first lines from the Broadway musical Rent. 525,600 minutes. 525,000 moments so dear. 500, I like this, keep going. 
600 minutes. How do you measure? How do you measure? Measure a year. <laughs> I've always wanted to do that. That's great. A uh, story of rent. It, it follows a group of friends uh, for one year uh, living in East Village, New York City, uh, as they navigate romance and heartbreak, and love and loss, poverty and HIV, AIDS, and, and the impact of the community that exists in their lives. And some of you know that uh, Joanne and I, we love the theater. It's, it's one of our favorite regular activities that we do for date nights, and, and we're slowly introducing our kids to theater as well. And the music and the drama, the, the lights and the, the costumes. But I gotta tell you that, that there's something deeper in theater for me. Uh, I took a uh, intro to acting class in college. It may not show, but I did. <laughs> and I remember that last lecture. Um, we were sitting in a semicircle on the floor. Our professor was sharing about her, her experiences with us in the class. She was naming uh, the strengths and growth areas and, and talking about the importance of theater in society. And she said something that I'll never forget. She said, uh, the theater is the only place where anyone and everyone is welcome and where they belong. It was a discussion and so I interjected in my incredible ignorance and arrogance and naivete. I said, uh, that can't be true. What about the church? Uh, I went into that class looking to learn about acting. I came out schooled in life. And I won't go into all the details of the conversation that ensued, but it was an important one. It's, it's one that has impacted me throughout ministry, throughout my life. What does it say about the church when we are not a place where all are welcome, where all belong? That opening song from Rent, it's called Seasons of Love, and it asks, in 525,600 minutes, how do you measure a year in the life? How about love? How about love? How about love? Measuring love, seasons of love. And if that's not at the core of this faith, this life of faith that we live, I'm not so sure what is. Because God is love. And because God is love, we are called to love. And Jesus, the human embodiment of God, who is love, commanded us to love without exception. And because of this love and through this love, we can call each other in. We can be called in. Because of this love and, and through this love, we can call each other in. We can be called in to a community where all are welcome, where all truly Belong. That, that's what I want to spend a few moments together exploring this morning as we close out the sermon series, how, how being called in, how it creates belonging in love. Okay. Last week, we, we turned to this letter to the Colossians, and we saw the author challenge the community that their identity was no longer of the empire, but of this Jesus. We were in chapter 1, and it talks about the image of Jesus being the image of the invisible God. And Jesus being the firstborn of all creation, the one in whom all things in heaven and on earth were created, things visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or powers. It talks about this Jesus who's the head of the body of the church. He, he's the beginning through whom God was pleased to reconcile all things to God's self. And our text continues today with, with that challenge. And we're going to go to verse 6 and 7. As you therefore have received Christ Jesus the Lord, continue to live your lives in him, rooted and built up in him, and established in the faith. Just as you were taught, abounding in thanksgiving. That sounds almost too simple, doesn't it? You once were people of the empire, now you are people of Jesus, so keep on being people of Jesus. But if that was happening, 
if that was truly and honestly happening, how much different would our world look today? Instead, there is hatred and division. There's the assertion that my truth is more truth than your truth, that my Jesus is better than your Jesus, that, that my faith is right and therefore your faith is wrong. You see, these early followers of Jesus in Colossae, they, they were not first-generation Christians. They weren't people who walked with Jesus. They, they were Gentiles who were removed from Jesus by at least a generation and nearly 400 miles away to the northeast in modern-day Turkey. And so while we don't know exactly how they received the good news of Jesus, the author is now writing to them to encourage them to stay true to their faith, to, to keep on being the people of Jesus. And here's why. I wonder if you've ever been the only new person in a community that was already well established. All right? <laughs> you know, growing up, my family and I moved around a lot. Uh, uh, once I calculated that uh, by the time I graduated high school, I had lived in nine different towns, meaning that every time I started a new school or tried to make new friends, I had to learn their customs and their culture and their way of doing things, right? Simple greetings, like, do you say y'all or not? Or, or do I choose to drink a Coke or a pop? What clothes were considered cool or appropriate? What food were common or appreciated? I don't know, maybe you've started a new job or, or joined a new organization or became a member of a, of a new club. Right? These Gentiles of Colossae, they're, they're navigating a similar experience to that. They once knew how to live life a certain way as Gentiles, as people of the empire. And now as they are living into this new identity as Christians, as, as people of faith, they're trying to learn how to do life in this new way. And the problem is that others are telling them that the way they are doing their life of faith is wrong. That it's not enough to live a life of faith trusting in the grace and love of Jesus. Instead, there's more to strive for. Some of them, they, they, want, um, they want the people of Colossae to become slaves to the intellectual quest of, of finding truth, capital T, of, of finding God through, through knowledge alone. And the author challenges that. Verse 8, see to it that no one takes you captive through philosophy and empty deceit. Others want them to, to earn their salvation through the performative ways they express their faith. And the author challenges that too. Verse 16, therefore do not let anyone condemn you in matters of food and drink or of observing festivals, new moons, or Sabbaths. And still others, they want them to have specific experiences of faith, mystical visions or ecstatic visions. And even this, the author challenges. Verse 18, do not let anyone disqualify you insisting on worship of angels dwelling on visions puffed up without cause by a human way of thinking. So as you therefore have received Christ Jesus our Lord, continue to live your lives in him, rooted and built up in him, and established in the faith, just as you were taught, abounding in thanksgiving. I love this image, rooted and built up. It's a mixing of analogies of sort, rooted from the botanical world, built up from the architectural world, but I think they work perfectly together to offer what it means to live this life of faith. Uh, there's this amazing story of a group of people called the Alabama 35. Um, two years ago in October, uh, there was a, a historical marker that was unveiled in Duluth, Minnesota. Uh, Duluth being the place where three black men, uh, Elias Clayton, Elmer Jackson, and Isaac McGee, were lynched on June 15, 1920. And you have to remember that those first few decades after the Civil War, they, they were especially painful and difficult for our country, especially for black folk, as they experienced a rise in hatred and racism against them, often leading to lynchings and, and murder. 
In 2017, the, the lynchings of these three men in Duluth was first recognized. 2017, almost 100 years later. And 100 people gathered in the community to participate in a soil collection ceremony. Um, they installed a, a 54 by 70 foot curved wall with, with bronze sculptures to remember these three men. And then they placed soil from this site into separate jars to be exhibited at the Legacy Museum in Montgomery, Alabama. So 2017, a few months later, a, a group of 35 Duluth residents Again, the, Duluth, uh, the Alabama 35, they traveled by bus from Duluth to Montgomery to attend the opening of this legacy museum, and they brought with them these jars of soil that are now displayed there. And included in that 35 was a man named Mike Tuscan. Uh, Mike Tuscan, uh, at the time, was the police chief of Duluth, and he was also the great nephew of the woman whose false accusations of rape led to the city's lynching of these three men. Uh, he was asked why he was making the trip with a group of 35. He said something like this. He said, we've been living with the wrong story as our foundation. We've been celebrating the wrong story as our foundation. It's time to honor the past and to commit to living a new story together built on a new foundation of love. And he would go on to name what we would call repentance, right, of acknowledging the harm and hurt and the role that white people played in the death of these black folk. He committed a life of changing their ways. But a new foundation built on love. What are we rooted in? What stories do we tell as the foundations of faith, of our faith? Is it our own sense of truth? Is it our own sense of being right at the expense of the other? Are we rooted in a tradition and a faith that keeps others out? I hope and I wonder <laughs> whether we can be a people rooted in Jesus. And what does that mean? What does it mean? How might we build our faith on this Jesus, on love and acceptance, on welcoming, on belonging? Because we all come from a specific perspective. We all name that there's a reason why we decide to follow this Jesus. And if I'm right, that means that you cannot be. But at the core, y'all, our faith is in love. It's in naming that the Jesus who came to this world embodied hope and joy and peace and love. There's a theologian named Peter Rollins. He, he, he talks about what it means to be a person of faith, to recognize the importance of the resurrection. And he says this, he says, I deny the resurrection of Christ every time I do not serve at the feet of the oppressed. Each day that I turn my back on the poor. I deny the resurrection of Christ when I close my ears to the cries of the downtrodden and lend my support to an unjust and corrupt system. How do we measure our lives? Is it through love? Will it be through love? I hope and I pray that our community might be one known not as Christians, not as people of faith, not as members belonging to a specific church. Might we be people of love? That wherever we go, whomever we encounter, that our identity is rooted in that love of Jesus, that love that came from God to us and through us, that we might be a love for the world. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. Holy One, we, we come before you, come gathered in community, online, and here on site. We pray that you would surround us with that love. 
that you would empower us to live our lives with that love, that we might be people who call each other in to that love, and to empower us and strengthen us and make us bold in our faith, for it is in your holy name that we pray, amen.